Hi, my name is Libby, and here is a nick uh, list of all of the nicknames I call my cat. Lord, Bobus, Lord Bobus, Benus, Bobean, Bobangus, Big Dingus, Dig Bingus, Big Chungus, Chonk, Bobanus, Gremble Boy, Scrambo, Scrambo Bembo, Tweakus, Tweakus Beakus, Tweak Boy, Stonkus Maximus, Gremble Bemble, Screamo Beano, Worm, Gargoyle, Chicken, Shrimp, Beeb, Bean, Raccoon, Grembo, Jessica Meowboy, Velvet Chicken, Pete's McGee. Okay, we're ready to go live. Oh, that was broadcasting. Okay, uh, it's Lightning Talks time uh, here at PyCon Line AU. Uh, you may know me as the Lightning Talk Czar from uh, PyCon AU. Uh, this year I am uh, confined to the United States, which makes me the Czar in exile, I guess, for this year's Lightning Talks. Uh, right, so how does this go? Uh, we have 14 or 15 presenters who are all going to be presenting five minute talks on topics of their choices. Uh, it's going to be completely ridiculous. Uh, there'll be, uh, there's a whole lot of very interesting looking topics here. Um, there'll be a stopwatch on the side of the screen, which will appear like that. Uh, and I guess it's time for us to start. Our first presenter is Tisham Da, who's going to be talking about coding at home with oh, wow. kids. Okay. I can be heard. Cool. So my timer starts now. So this talk is about uh, this one at the back. So coding at home with kids, how I learned to share the screen with my son. Uh, so I have been working from home like everybody has been and screen sharing is a big part of what you are doing these days. So uh, pair programming over, uh, over Zoom or all these this clients, so I have counted around 10 of these things. Zoom, Skype, Teams, Meet, GoToMeeting, WebEx, Jitsi, one of my colleagues used. Uh, so many things we have to install. Uh, I've recently moved into middle management, so it's an endless stream of calls. Uh, occasionally, I have to let the another screen, a TV screen, perform child minding. Other than that, uh, the, my son has been taking lessons over Seesaw. Uh, which is uh, online, and he occasionally comes in. And occasionally we do uh, pair programming uh, by getting him to read the keyboard and write a letter at a time. Uh, so he started early. He started using the keyboard early and poking at the keys. Uh, so I started only using a computer in my 20s, so he's starting up very early. Uh, so uh, I, it's uh, one of the talks talked about uh, mirror neurons, and so the, well, he sees me doing something and he copies what I'm doing. So that's sort of how it ended up this way. This one is very close to my heart. He had uh, some surgery and we were watching separate screens together. He is all zoned out from the, pain, uh, from the painkillers and from the uh, anesthesia. And I'm working away uh, on a framework uh, for, for, for fiction. It's a DRF plus React app, which was going to be presented the next day in San Francisco in TechCrunch. Uh, so, so we ended up trying to do things together. So I call it pair playing, I guess, in a way. He is in front, and I am telling him what to do, and he's just drawing lines, which is some sort of work. Uh, he, um, Pascal does schematic editing. Uh, he is entertained by 2 plus 2 and keeps on adding numbers up, which is sort of his version of the uh, Ender's Game in, uh, in the console here. He also likes doodling in Blender. Uh, Blender also has a very nice graphical programming uh, sort of node graph mechanism for joining things and making, uh, changing them uh, color and so on. So it's, uh, I saw the Unreal Engine sort of node graph. It reminded me of Blender's node graph. Uh, he likes trains. Uh, Pascal likes trains. Uh, sometimes when we are doing pair playing, he would set up this uh, uh, imaginary railways and such and break up the physics of the train simulator. Train simulator runs into the trees, yes. And run into the mountains. And run into the mountains. And then he can also do splines and animations. 
Uh, recently, we went to the library and he picked up Scratch, uh, which is uh, sort of something uh, he, uh, that has been talked about as visual programming as well. What does Scratchy do? Huh? Huh? And sometimes we make our custom games, uh, custom toys, uh, where uh, the, this snake is, a, uh, and then he designs his own games, and I try my best to program them on the small screen. It's not easy. Uh, need to, uh, there are lots of discussions around limiting screen time, uh, need to find appropriate content, need to keep him rooted in the real world. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, guests are coming. What? When, Daddy? Yes, five minutes are almost over. Uh, it's okay. Uh, so, yeah, need to keep him rooted in the real world, need to separate work and play. And uh, this is the fun times we have. Uh, so, n out of screen, mini trains going for a ride. And the screen is still ever present for taking photos and recording the moment. Yeah, that's all I have, but it's an uh, interesting life we are leading. Thanks, Tisham. That was that was great. Okay, uh, so let's see. I have some buttons that I need to click. Uh, our next presenter is going to be uh, Juan Morais, who's going to share with us something Hi. about a uh, bot that shares game development content in Spanish. Please make yep. it welcome. Get up. How's it going, Christopher? Thank you very much. And Tisham, that was an awesome talk. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I'm going to show you a bot that shares content that's uh, related to game development in Spanish. Um, a bit of me, uh, I'm a Panamanian software engineer based in Wellington, New Zealand, currently working as a software developer at Shiasis. Uh, so if you heard Tom Eastman's talk about Secatur, I work with him, he's awesome. I'm also a former game developer uh, at Pickpock. I started doing game programming and then moved into doing uh, game analytics. Therefore, I transitioned from games into that engineering and recently web tech and startups. I'm also a big outdoors enthusiast. I love mountain biking, birding, hiking, and I like having one too many hobbies. So what is this thing? It's a, it's a Python bot that interacts with tweets that match a set of filters. It uses the Tweepy library to access the Twitter API. And it's basically deployed with Heroku via GitHub. Real simple stuff. I just push to the master branch in GitHub. It does the thing, and hopefully it works. Uh, it, it has almost reached 1,000 followers. That's actually very cool. Um, it's good to see, see you know, community building up, people talking to each other, sharing ideas and whatnot. Uh, here's some basic, a, a basic example of how like the main entry point of the code works. Something really simple, nothing over-engineered, right? I gave it the keywords that I want to match for. So you could really just do hashtag PyConLineIU and it will uh, catch any tweets. Uh, languages, I'm just telling it to listen to sp the Spanish language, but you could add any other language locales that you want to, so that you, you know, English, Portuguese, uh, German, whatever. It just creates a, a an instance of an API, you know, with keys that you give it to. It creates this thing called a stream listener, which basically tells Twitter um, and Tweepy that every new tweet that comes live, I uh, will get it and they will, you know, uh, manipulate it and decide to do stuff with it, you know, commenting or retweeting or liking it. The options are endless. Uh, this is on status method that basically tells me uh, every time I get a tweet, it uh, it's processed th through this uh, part. And I can go, okay, can I interact with it? Um, cool, then I will maybe retweet it if it hasn't been retweeted yet. Otherwise, it doesn't do anything. It's that simple. Uh, the, the code that says if I can interact with this tweet is basically saying, okay, is it mine? Skip it. Is it possibly sensitive, aka uh, not safe for work? Then skip it as well. Uh, is it a quote retweet? Uh, you know, retweets where you add like your own custom message? Well, skip that one as well. And if it's just a basic retweet, then skip it too. Um, I've been adding these uh, flags because sometimes you get like a really famous post from like, you know Twitter and Real Engine, and a lot of people are going to re um, be retweeting those. And it, will, it looks like you're spamming or do, like with a lot of duplicate tweets, and that doesn't make it a good experience. What did I make it? For me, it was a perfect recipe. First, uh, I wanted to learn how to make my own bot, and I wanted to learn how they worked. Uh, the opportunity uh, was there, as in there were lots of game development bots that shared content, but none of them did it in Spanish, which is the language I speak um, natively. Uh, community, well, I like to, you know, I, I thought there could be an, a great opportunity to promote interaction between Hispanic game developers. And passion is, I love building communities, you know. Uh, there was all this, you know, uh, cool variables added to me being like, hey, I could actually just make this button. It has a nice purpose. Challenges, 
there are always going to be some nice challenges, right? Um, applying for the Twitter developer program was so tedious, I had to wait for like uh, two to three weeks. Um, eventually, got my permissions and my API keys that I needed to actually uh, get started. Um, the bot was actually disabled for liking posts, which is my fault because it violates Twitter's policies. Um, but then I modified the code to stop liking posts. It came back to life. They were pretty uh, nice about it. I just said, hey, um, I didn't know about it. Can I just modify the code and would it be OK? They said, yep, all good. Happened. Thank you for everything. Um, I'm on Twitter at TimRods, and you can check the bot at ESGameDevBot. Uh, contributors are welcome if you want to go on GitHub. It's just slash my username, TimRods, slash ES dash game dev dash bot thanks juan uh one of the things i love about the uh the python community is that we are a community and we uh do a, do a great work bringing people together and it's uh, great to see yet another example of that uh so one of the things with our lightning talks here is that uh we like to uh we like to have some controversy and uh, get some talks that you know probably the program committee wouldn't really like to accept because they uh, they say things that are uh, kind of uh, kind of controversial. Uh, Peter here is once he's shared his screen or if his screen has disappeared. I'm just waiting for Peter's screen to reappear. Right, uh, Peter's talk is controversial because it's called. Please make him welcome. All right, thank you very much, Chris. Um, hi, I'm Peter, and I'm here to tell you that Java is better than Python. Uh, hang on, that can't be right, because we are at PyCon, we don't do language wars. There's the right title. When is Java better than Python? I'm here to answer a question for you. So uh, confession time, um, I am a Java programmer, and when I tell people that at PyCon, they... Um, say, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, it also means I dress like this, which um, I don't actually dress like that. I don't even own a suit. And if you'd like to know more about uh, how programmers dress stereotypes are wrong, watch my previous lightning talk, the, uh, Pi the Fashion of Python AU. So uh, let's start with um, what's good about Python. So good about Python, it's quick and natural to write. When you get on a whiteboard and you start writing code in pseudocode, Fairly good chance you just works in Python. Um, print hello world is literally print hello world. It's very easy to write. Um, so much power, you can do just about anything you want to in Python. So what's bad about Java? Java gets in your way. You need a compiler. You need to uh, set up a lot of things to get that working. You need to know about classes and objects oriented programming just to be able to write hello world. Your exceptions are all checked. Like they are, if your code might throw an error, you have to declare that error. And if you call code that might throw an error, you have to deal with that error. And uh, when um, a programmer has a problem and thinks they'll use Java, then they have a problem factory. So given that, why did Twitter change from Ruby to Java? And sorry for using a Ruby example. I broke this talk like yesterday. Um, they did this in 2011. They were a famous Ruby shop rewriting Java. And the answer is, when you are writing a script, a Python script or a JavaScript, and I mean a script written in the language Java, nothing to do with JavaScript, uh, we see that um, the Python script takes a lot less effort. You, you, you can just write and run, it's there. The JavaScript takes a lot of effort. You need to set up build environments, class paths, gets a little bit hairy. But what happens when your script gets a bit bigger and you start to have uh, a team involved? Now you've still got the same amount of effort in writing your code, but you have to deal with everyone else's code as well. Um, you're going to have somebody refactored a method, and now it takes an enum instead of a boolean. And you didn't know about that, but there was no test case for you calling that code, and so it didn't, you didn't know until runtime. Um, things go wrong. Java will catch that for you. The compiler is your friend here. Probably still less effort to just write it in Python anyway. But there's a step bigger than that. What happens when you have more than one team all working in the same area of code? Um, at that point, the Java doing the work for you to catch those errors starts to pay off. And there are tools that sort of make it easy to use Python. You can declare your types. Um, you can um, you know, add unit tests and so on. They help. But Java has a lot of that built in and ready to go for you. 
So, um, which is why if you go and look on Wikipedia like I did last night of what are the languages used on the world's most popular websites, when you are big and you have billions of users, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a big company. Java is number one. Java is the most popular, like it's used in the most of the um, very common website, the, the extremely popular websites. Python's popular too. It's uh, number three there, which is respectable. Java's number one though, because Java solves the kinds of problems that you have when you have lots of disparate teams all working in the same area. Um, there are other ways to solve those problems. You could go to microservices, at which case you start having infrastructure set up problems instead of dealing with other people's code problems. Um, but Java will certainly get you there. So um, what's my point here? My point here is that you need to recognize when your favorite tool, the tool that you are an expert in, is the wrong tool for the job. And we had a whole keynote about this yesterday. If you missed it, go and watch it. It was an excellent keynote. And uh, in that keynote, we learned about the firefighters who invented, um, who were, lives were lost fighting a fire. Um, and because they needed to put down their tools and run from the fire, they needed to stop fighting a fire, which was the job they had trained for, and run. And they didn't know that. And in this analogy, Java is not the huge fire that you are running away from. Java is the escape fire, which is a tool that sounds like a bad idea until you have heard about it and practice with it and know when it's time to light the escape fire. Uh, thank you very much. And consider Java if you have Java problems. Hey, thanks, Peter. Uh, lots of interesting feedback on the, uh, on, the stream, uh, on the stream comments, which I've just managed to pull back up on my other computer. Uh, hopefully my frame rate should be a bit better. Uh, things were uh, getting a bit choppy just there. Okay, uh, so up next we have uh, Evan Kahilis, who's going to ask us how we miss this. Please make him welcome. Hello. Cool. So um, this past term I did a web security course at UNSW, and we're learning various techniques in this Quokka Bank infrastructure that they had made. And in particular, we had to learn about server-side request forgery. Now to perform it on this code to get the server to load content from itself. The first thing we notice is that it's running Python 2 code, which is sad. Um, but what it's trying to do is stop us from using localhost using this deny list. Um, and what we can do is try and bypass this using these particular functions down here, get host by name. Um, okay, so quick important tangent. Did you know that you can encode localhost as a decimal, but you can also encode it as hex or octal or binary, maybe, I don't know, I tried these two and they didn't work for me, so we'll just leave it as is. Um, but they also work on segmented bytes, so you can encode each different part in its own base. Um, okay. Anyway, which one of these works? Well, I tried all of them and segmented octal works. And I thought, okay, this is a strange bug. And it got me thinking, does this work in Python 3 too? Well, no, it doesn't. Um, and this should be a cause for alarm because hackers might um, try and attack us. But who cares, right? Because Python 2 is already retired. But the question we want to ask is, why did we miss this? How do we manage to miss a bug in Python 2? Well, let's go and read the docs. First, we'll go to the socket library docs. Um, there's no notes here for our function, which is a shame. Um, but surely the change logs should have something, right? If there's an update, it should be there. Well, I search for the change logs. There's nothing there. Okay, what about a Google search? Maybe the change log search wasn't good enough. Nothing. All right. Well, if it's not documented properly, the next step is to go and read the source code. So here is the linked source. Um, and we search for the, the function name, and it doesn't exist. Why? Well, because it's implemented in the C um, socket module. Um, OK, so let's go find that. Here's the result and the full file. Um, and here's the function that we want to look at. Uh, and we'll look through some of the function calls. In particular, set IP address seems to be our main function, judging by the length. We'll skim through it. Um, and we found the offending line. It's using scanf. But when was it removed? Let's go check the main branch. This, C, uh, this level of C code is just too complex for me to read, and there's no documentation. Um, and I don't understand Git or GitHub well enough to use it for a search. All I know is whether the code is there or not. OK, I'll just use binary search. And then I found it. This is the commit that fixed this. And this is what it was replaced with. But wait. This is in 2013 in Python 3.4. And where does this go? Wait, this is a pull request. This is not the issue. I guess it's another dead end, but wait a minute. Let's use this issue number in the bug tracker. And aha, we found the original um, issue. They found that it was incorrectly parsing IP. And uh, they found some bugs. 
And they also say that they suggest not using ad hoc parsing, which is what they were doing before. Awesome work. But they also say that they don't think this should go in 2.7 because it's more of an enhancement rather than a bug fix. So this is why it's still there. OK, but what if we search for other bugs? Aha, we found our exact issue. This is from 2016, and it's still open. Uh, and what they say is that this still happens on Mac OS in Python 3. And I did, and it does because I tested it last night. And it's also OS dependent. And they also say that they have the exact same security issue. So actually, these two are equal sometimes depending on your OS. But I guess we already knew that because it says that in the docs at the beginning. So maybe this is an issue. Maybe it's not. But I hope you learned something because it's now 3 AM when I was writing these slides. And I've spent like the last 12 hours researching and writing a five minute talk about this. Yes, thank you. I'm done. OK. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Evan, for that. Uh, one of the things I, I love about bug trackers is that every now and again, the Python project decides that they need to change their bug trackers. And now there's one extra level of indirection of bug trackers uh, for you to all uh, click on when you're uh, trying to search for, for bugs like this. So hopefully <laughs> this gets easier. Hey, up next, we have uh, Kit Darko, who is going to ask us uh, why not throw your devices in the sea and go live in a cave? Good question. Hey, so um, as you're probably aware, we live in a world that is constantly under surveillance and increasingly so. This comes in the form of corporate surveillance from massive mega corporations in the US, in China and other places and in government mandated surveillance. So I live in Tasmania where my state government recently gave every single person's photographs from their driver's license to a private company for facial recognition software. Cool and normal. And one thing that I'm personally very worried about is that a lot of governments around the world are looking like there's a not insignificant chance that they might slide into full on fascism. And that's something that has historically not gone well for a lot of people. And so one thing you might think as a reaction to this is, well, tech is really handy and I need to use it. So I need to protect my privacy so that I can be protected from these things. You might first do something like move to Apple and then realize that they're also a major corporation and they just say they believe in privacy. You can't actually, you have to take them at face value. You might move to Pure Foss and then host your own server in your garage that you have to spend days tinkering with when it inevitably breaks. And then you might just end up giving up and crying and thinking, Stuff this, technology was a mistake, computers were a mistake, throw it all in the sea, I give in. But that kind of misses the point. So technology is, yeah, it's, it's fun, it's handy, it's cool, we love it. But more importantly, it's there to enable human communication and human collaboration. And it's enabled all of us to work together in ways that historically we haven't been able to before it's enabled an unprecedented level of interconnectivity and shared values and shared communities and a lot of beautiful things also extremely importantly tech is increasingly used to enable accessibility to bring people into society in ways that they were previously locked out people who couldn't see people who can't see, people who can't hear, people who have mobility issues, people who have social anxiety, <laughs> um, so on and so forth, find technology has helped to interact with others and to build community with others. And also most people don't have the time, the energy, the expertise or the motivation to go and self-host their own stuff either. So both the self-hosting, I'm going to do everything in my little bubble and I'm going to go and live off on a mountain approach, they're kind of selfish. 
Um, so what's the solution, right? Um, so for one thing, we're all software developers, so we can use free and open source software. Um, yeah, where possible. But while doing that, the important things that we should be keeping in mind are not what's a cool feature that can be added to this package, what's a cool feature that can be added to my OS, but rather what are some accessibility issues here? How is this hard for people to use? How does this get in the way? How can we enable them in the way that the private um, corporate solutions do? And from them, we kind of need to advocate for change. That means getting political. That means, you know, letter writing, petitioning, calling MPs, getting involved in direct action and so on and so forth and talking to people so that we can build a future that's a bit more local, a bit more cooperative, that's a bit more publicly owned, that's not so vulnerable to foreign governments or to corporate control, something that just works a little bit better. And that's a hell of a lot better if we can get there than just running away from it all. Thank you. Thanks, Kit. That was that was fantastic. Uh, let's see. Uh, so up next, we have uh, Henry Walshaw, who is going to talk to us about something that's close to everyone's heart, uh, how to get outside during these <laughs> unprecedented times. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hi, all. So my name is Henry. Um, I've been a GIS geek for a long time now. Um, and because of that, I work a lot in Python already. Uh, feel free to at me on various bits and pieces. Um, so I want to talk about um, getting outside and making um, having a good idea about where we can actually go during these kind of wonderful times here in Melbourne. So a bit of a quick content warning, at least at the start here, I'm going to mention a bit about COVID-19 and some of the impacts. Um, so please, if that's an issue, uh, yeah, come back in hopefully three or four minutes and you'll be cool. All righty. So just to get started, uh, in Melbourne, we've kind of got a bit of a COVID-19 problem. Uh, this is, for those that know Melbourne, this is De Graves Lane at 9 a.m. on a Saturday um, from the middle of July, sure, but it's pretty much the same now. It's kind of pretty dead and it's pretty empty. One of the big things that we've got in Melbourne is that at the moment, since we're under stage four restrictions, and we're all kind of counting down to when the Premier announces how long they continue for, because we've got those stage four restrictions, we're not really allowed more than five kilometres from home. Okay, so at least until the 13th, we're not allowed that far from home. And if you jump on the government websites, um, you can take a look at a five kilometer buffer around your place. So this is me just creating a buffer around my local train station here. The five days actually is, as it turns out, a pretty long way when you're dealing with as the crows flies distance as far as you can get. But I'm a bit of a pedant. I love maps. I wanted to see how far you can actually travel five kilometers instead of going uh, five kilometers in a straight line, because as it turns out, they're not the same. So, first of all, a few imports. I'm not going to dwell on these. Feel free to at me, um, especially if you need a hand installing the spatial libraries later on. They're always a huge pain, which is a bit of a shame. First step, geocoding your address. We use GeoPy for that, because what it does is it turns your address from a actual string, the place, into a latitude, longitude point. Real easy to do, and for those that watched some of the GIS talks on Friday especially, uh, you would have heard mention of GeoPandas, which builds in geocoding as well. And of course, and unfortunately my little map symbol's not loading there, but in the middle there you can see, would be able to see in your own code, where your point is on a nice little interactive map. Okay, so I did want to try this out with GeoPatra, but unfortunately I ran out of time, so Sanger um, I will promise, I promise you I will try this out. So geocoding, it's built into geopandas. Get yourself a panda series that contains your addresses. Turn those into a point. That's easy. And again, you can put that on map. I'm not going to go over that too much, just in terms of time. The next big trick is getting the data, the street network that's within five kilometers of your home. An easy way to do that is to use the OSMNX library, which is a library to download um, the data within five kilometers of your home into a network X graph. And we do that by getting the bounds based on a five kilometer buffer from home. Okay, so we can do that pretty easily. 
five kilometer circle, that's a 5K buffer, that's the same one that we saw before. We use OSM and X to download the data, and this is the actual data, the points, the streets as lines, and the intersections and traffic lights and buildings and addresses as points on a really simple map, okay? We can do a bit of calculation with Network X to work out, okay, what nodes are within five kilometers of our center node. Okay, we can easily do that. Borrowing heavily from some quick examples, we get a nice little map here that shows us this is where I can reach in five kilometers. Notice that I can't get across the river here. Okay, it takes too long in terms of distance to go around and cross the bridges. Um, whereas if I looked at my five kilometer circle, I get all the way across into the bay. So again, I'm jetting through time, so I'm gonna rush through this. Um, we use a Network X Eager graph to get all the One points. Minute. We turn those. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> we get an exterior polygon, which means that we can turn that into what's called a convex hull. And here we can see the difference between a convex hull, which is the big, uh, the little polygon here, and the big circle. Rushing through this now, but we want an alpha shape instead. So we use the alpha shape library to generate a more accurate boundary. We can do a bit of optimization, but this is essentially what changing the alpha value does. How much of your polygons connected together? We can run through that, we can put it all together, put it all on a map with a bit of code, and here, finally, you can see a more accurate polygon, this middle section here, which is actually the area which I can get with five kilometers of travel versus the convex hull, where I can somehow cross the river, versus the buffer itself, which is much, much further. And uh, that's me. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, thanks. everyone for watching. Thanks, Henry. Uh, so now you can find out uh, exactly where it is that you can go to uh to uh to exercise uh now and i'm told uh that dan is having a press conference right now uh people will post all the information into the chat because they're paying attention to it so uh you know maybe don't leave the lightning talks and uh and watch the chat and twitter instead okay up next we have alan who's going to be talking to us about uh open source data pipelines uh, thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm going to be talking about a project called Meltano, um, which is an open source Python project developed by GitLab. Um, so there's several components to this project. Um, the actual it's that the acronym is Model, Extract, Load, Transform, Analyze, Notebook, and Orchestrate. Obviously, that's a lot to cram into a five-minute talk, but I'll give it a go. Um, so what is Meltano? Um, it's an open source project, like I say. It does ETL or ELT, which is Extract, Transform, Load, or ELT, which is very similar, but it's just obviously the load happens before the transform. Um, so it's a way of getting data out of the source system, doing some things with that data, and loading it into a destination. Um, it's a simple project in a lot of ways because it um, goes for this conventional over configuration approach. So it bundles several other open source tools and wraps them in a friendly uh, CLI, and even gives you a nice front end as well. Um, and it could be considered a possible alternative to tools like Stitch or Firetran. Um, if any of you have heard of those, or um, even a more enterprise level kind of turnkey solutions uh, like Pento or that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, data systems can be very complex. Um, this screenshot is actually from um, a GitHub project, which is a data pipeline to get data out of Goodreads, um, the reading platform, and load it into a data warehouse. It actually uses e um, Amazon EMR and Spark to do this. As you can see, there's a lot of moving parts in the first diagram here. Um, so it's probably overkill, it's very complicated, and especially for a personal project, um, there's no need for this kind of complexity. Uh, so Meltano kind of strips away that complexity um, and uses tools like DBT, which I'll try and get into in a second. Um, so the first step in the modeling, this uses files called M5O files um, to define your data models. Um, it's a bit similar to uh, LookML, which is a tool, um, from a tool called Looker, which um, is also like a, a business intelligence tool. Um, so you can define your table structures, the kind of drawings you'll be doing, any aggregations in this kind of file. Um, and then Meltano will actually auto-generate SQL for you, which will help you in the analysis and visualization step. Um, and for the extract and load, it uses Stitch, um, which is um, kind of a paid for service, but they've got an open source um, component to that called Singer, um, which is actually what Meltano uses. So this is all free open source uh, tooling. Um, and yet yeah, by default, Meltano comes with a few um, integrations. So it has a uh, Postgres connector. You can connect to various different SaaS tools and marketing tools like Stripe, Salesforce, Zendesk, Facebook Ads, Shopify, Google Analytics, and Google Ads. Um, and then you can write that data to just dis destinations. So um, by default, it includes Postgres, uh, Snowflake, SQLite, JSONL, and good old-fashioned CSV as well. 
Um, so you can easily also add your own custom extractors using the Meltano uh, command uh, CLI. So you can do Meltano add and then the name of your extractor. So I created one for SurveyMonkey here. Um, so I just use the open source uh, tap SurveyMonkey. Um, and then in, inside your uh, YML file, you can just um, set the kind of environment variables that you might need to access that service. And then you can test it on the command line by doing Meltano ELT, the name of the tap, which is SurveyMonkey in this case, and the, the place you want to send the data to in this case, uh, target Postgres. Um, so like I say, the transformation step is handled by an open source tool, tool called dbt, which is also written in Python. Um, it's very simple. It's just writing SQL, basically. Uh, but they've added uh, Ginger templating to it. So it's kind of SQL with that bolted on. Um, I do recommend checking out the tutorial. Uh, they've got a nice example project called Jaffle Shop, which probably appeals to the Australian audience here. So yeah, that's worth checking out. Um, I'm not going to go into this in much detail, but this is an example of DBT model for SurveyMonkey that I built. So I'm getting questions, responses, and survey details, joining them together, and then doing a simple aggregation and just counting the number of choices for a particular question. Um, and then for the orchestration layer, it uses Airflow, again, an open source tool written in Python. Um, so here you can use it to schedule your data pipelines um, and control the um, when they run and that kind of thing. So you can also actually um, expose the Airflow UI using Multano commands here. Um, you can also plug in alternatives like Prefect, which is um, another alternative to Airflow. Um, and then Multano actually gives you a nice visualization on top of that. So in the UI, you can then um, generate um, graphs from that using um, yeah, just Multano's language, basically. So I'll give you a quick uh, demo here. Um, this is the kind of connectors I've got installed. I've got Postgres, Shopify, and a thing called Aura, which is this ring that I wear here to track my sleep. So I wear this at night, and it records how much sleep I'm getting or not getting. Um, I have this on a pipeline schedule. So here I can see the aura runs every hour. You can also just configure it to use cron style um, scheduling. So however often you want. Oops. Um, yeah. And then I can then send the data in a graph format. So here I've got the amount of sleep I'm getting, which you can probably see isn't quite enough. I'm getting less than eight hours on a regular basis. But this is the graph that Nottana generates. Done. Thanks for that, Alan. Thank you. Uh, looks like the chat is very, very pleased. Okay. Uh, great. So uh, up next, uh, we have uh, Matt Senger, who's going to be talking to us about event diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. Please make him welcome. Hi, everyone. My name is Matt. My parents are he, him, and his. In true lightning talk style, I'm trying a brand new streaming layout. So please put your fingers for me and my laptop, which is about to melt. I'm here to talk about improving diversity, inclusion, and accessibility of the Urbex. This is something which Python AU and indeed Python Line AU do very well, but there's always room for improvement. There have been some talks about these things already, but it's important, so here's another one. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm broadcasting, the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay respects to their elders, past, and present. An integral part of an inclusive event is a code of conduct. A code of conduct defines unacceptable behavior for your event, consequences for that behavior, and how to get support. Having a plan on how to respond to code of conduct incidents and a team to action that response are as important as the code of conduct itself. The contributor covenant is an excellent place to start. Next, ensure that your venues are accessible. Ensure all attendees, regardless of their ability, can access all necessary parts of your venue, including common areas, theatres, bathrooms, and stages. Consider using captioning, sign language interpreters, and hearing aid loops. Ensure your website is accessible to all attendees too. I recommend checking out Dawn's Python at Line AU talk. This talk has been disabled, which covers accessibility more generally. There are more than two genders. Don't ask people to choose between two boxes they may not fit into. Offer people the option to display their pronouns in their online handles and on their name badges. Do your best to avoid gender bathrooms. Don't only offer men's or unisex shirts if you're providing merch. Unisex doesn't actually fit everybody. Give people an option for their informal name at registration. Some people don't use their legal name, and not all names fit the first name, last name pattern. Check out Karina C. Zona's talk, Schemas for the Real World, and Open Science talk, Collecting Information with Care, for more information on these considerations. People are from different socioeconomic backgrounds. Endeavor to offer grants to enable attendance of people who are less financially well off. Offer childcare at your event. 
It's not as hard as it sounds, and parents like your candidates too. Explicitly make a space to welcome newbies to your event. Avoid contempt culture, as described in Orin Shaw's work, and explain any in-jokes you use. That's all I've got for now, but there are plenty of resources about these topics. Feel free to contact me if you'd like more information. You can find me on Twitter and other places as Mattsen, at M-A-T-T-C-E-N, or take a look at my blog post for more details. It's available at blog.matson.com slash diverse underscore events, or you can use the QR code. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. That was fantastic. Okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Matt. Up next, we have Kira Patterson, who is going to ask us a very, very important question. Hi. So, I'm here today to talk about why people don't use password managers. So, to start with, how many people do use password managers? So, depends on the study, but it's around 12% of people who use a third-party package password manager and around 18% of people use the built-in browser password manager function at least some of the time. And why should we care? So passwords are anti-human infrastructure. We, it requires us to remember random things regularly. We're not good at memorizing and we're really bad at randomization, so they're anti-human. On top of that, about 86% of people admit to reusing their passwords and 2% of people use one password for every online service they use. So until we can upload our brains onto the internet, we probably need something to help us get around this password problem. I gave a much longer version of this talk about a year ago, and quite a few people have told me that they're absolutely certain they know why people don't use password managers, and they're usually wrong. So I'll dispel two myths first. So first, it's not laziness. Yeah, laziness might contribute to why you don't consistently use a password manager, but it's actually not why people don't begin to use one. We're not as lazy as we think. Right now, there are people spending their Sunday knitting, volunteering at conferences and giving tech talks and listening to tech talks, sometimes even all at once. We're not that lazy when we're motivated. Second, it's not because people feel secure. So 90% or more of people in every study they've done say that they're concerned about others accessing their data online, they're worried about leaks, they're worried about being hacked. It's not because people feel secure enough. So why don't they use a password manager? So there's five reasons and I'll go into them now. So number five, we don't like to use things we're not certain how to use. We like to feel competent, we don't want to be embarrassed, and a lot of people are concerned that they either can't use a password manager or they'll do something wrong and break everything forever. It's scary. The fourth reason is values conflict. So a really, like a really common value for adults is to feel independent or in control. And most users of password managers have reported that they make it makes them feel like they've lost control over their access to their important accounts. Uh, number three, we're pretty bad at threat perception if the threat isn't a tiger chasing us. Uh, most non-tech people still think of hacking as being something that's targeted at the individual, and they are aware that they're not that important, so they discount the threat. The second thing is we get confused and we do nothing if we're not sure what to do. And experts don't always agree <laughs> on using a password manager and people panic and just sit still. But the biggest reason, the number one reason people give for why they don't use a password manager is actually security. Download this free software and give it all your passwords absolutely sounds like a scam. So you can't really blame people. So to summarize, we give something that people not sure they can use, makes them feel out of control, fixes an issue they're not sure they have, that experts don't even agree is necessary, and it looks like a scam, we can't really blame them for not taking that step. So what do you do if you want to help your friends, you want to make people to be safe online? It's two main things. The first is to be really clear on why and how the tool you're suggesting will solve somebody's problem. Let them feel competent and like make sure they know it's going to be effective. But the most important thing is be a cheerleader, not a fear monger. If you can help people feel confident and make sure you don't scare them so much that they clam up and do nothing, you'll be on the way. So people are complex, varied creatures, but we share a lot of our basic motivations. 
We all seek connection, acceptance and validation, and we all avoid embarrassment, rejection and danger. So if you want to help people change their behaviour and stay safe online, start by remembering that we're all human. And that's me. Thanks, Kira. <laughs> I, uh, I always love hearing these talks about the human factors involved in technology, and uh, that talk was no exception. Uh, up now, uh, Jason is going to be talking to us about uh, what looks to be one of my favourite 1980s musicals. Oh, no, it's actually chess. All right, so um, while I was uh, sitting here in Melbourne wondering what I'm going to do for the next few months while I was in lockdown, um, in a previous life, um, just just over the, the strait back in Tasmania, I'd, um, I got second in the under-18 chess tournament and was, led the team that won the high school uh, state chess tournament. So, um, whoops. So uh, that uh, led me to wonder what I can do with a with a game of essentially a game of chess. So I, I played it for you know a long time, but had to give it up when I went to uni because it took too much time. Um, chess has been played for hundreds of years. It's been analysed to death. Um, there's only a couple of opening moves people use, even though um, you've got potentially six, uh, ten pieces to choose from. People only move like two or three for their first opening moves. And um, as of 1997, um, even the the best player in the world, uh, Gary Kasparov, uh, was beaten in a in a tournament from a computer. Um, and here's someone who's actually, you know, enjoying watching chess. So that there are people that are like that. Um, so what I wanted to do was essentially get away from uh, computer analysis of of chess so much. I wanted to play against humans. Um, so what I ended up doing was. Um, three-dimensional chess. So um, this is this is more of a, a canned demo at this point. So I've figured out how to use the three JS library. That's that's that there. On um, uh, how to place uh, pieces inside a. At the moment, it's an eight by eight by eight grid. Um, uh, Right, so yeah, um, I've had to make my own pieces just because the two-dimensional pieces don't make a lot of sense in a 3D space. So um, I even, like, just to prove it, like, that, that's my um, my knight piece, essentially. Um, uh, hang on, let's, let's get back to that. All right, so... Um, the idea is that uh, you um, log into a, uh, a Django server and essentially um, submit your moves. Um, now, the notation for chess is, shows up here where you can just say, like, the first move in this, in this particular game is just D4, and it means move, move a piece to that position. But when you're in a, a three-dimensional space, this quickly becomes unwieldy. So um, notation for this is basically going to be x1, y1, uh, z2, which, which is going to be this piece here, and specify the, the x, y, z coordinates of, of the finishing position. Um, there's a couple of uh, concepts in chess that probably aren't going to make it to the 3D world so well. Um, one is the... One minute. Right, thank you. Um, the concept of uh, castling your king. or um, So this move here, where he uh, swaps two positions at once, that doesn't make a lot of sense when you're in a, when you're in a 3D space. Um, I was planning on having the entire outside ring 
uh, being a bunch of rooks, but when you've got 20 of them in a, in a small space, that doesn't make so much sense. Um, so at the moment, you can uh, import new pieces yourself. Um, I've got here uh, positions and directions which a, a piece can take. Uh, you can define a play area, which is just like 4x4x4 four by four by four or 8x8x8. Eight by eight by eight. Uh, again, you can import which pieces you want, their starting positions, and the idea is to essentially figure out what makes what what works in 3D. Thank you, um, Jason. Uh, yep. Sorry, we don't get to hear the end of your talk, but you know you only have five minutes. Uh, okay. Up next, we have Carl Carsten, who uh, is going to uh, answer a question uh, to which the answer I would give is don't, but. Uh, well, maybe it's uh, maybe he has a better answer. Am I up? The clock started. Look, clock started. Hello. Yes. Yeah, so, Chris, I thoroughly appreciate the don't because when people asked me that question years ago, it was like, ah, so much work to teach someone how to program when you have no idea what they're up to, et cetera, et cetera. You just want to give them a little help and get them started and kick them on their way. And then I saw a talk by Katni Rodner at a convention and she was showing off the Circuit Python Express by Adafruit. This is not quite a sales pitch. It's kind of like a sales pitch because you got to buy something. And uh, you can get some of these things. They're a very similar thing. You can get Tim's Plamu. These are all things that'll, that'll, uh, that'll work. Anyway, so you get this thing from Adafruit. You get a USB battery, you get a USB cable, you bundle all that stuff together in a little thing, shove it in your backpack so that when someone says, hey, teach me some programming, you're like, okay, we're gonna take this battery and we're gonna, we're gonna plug this little sucker in and uh, you get a little light on there. And it's like, hey, that's pretty cool. And then you, yeah, oops, there goes the battery. Live battery. So, you hand it to them and inevitably they grab it. And see all those lights that blink on? That's because there's touch sensors around the outside of this thing. And inside here is Python code. And this is where you get into the explanation of, there's some Python code that said, if you touch a thing, turn a light on like that. And, and then they say, show me or something. And how do I turn this off? And you're like, okay, well for that, we need a laptop. Cue the, cue the thing. There we go, all right. And so you, uh, you plug this into the laptop and it is a USB stick. I have a USB stick around here somewhere. We all know what a USB stick looks like, right? Uh, you plug it in and a, a file manager comes up somewhere, maybe. Hey, look at that, file manager. And we click here on CircuitPy and uh, look at that. So there's this little file on here called code.py. It's right there. And uh, so you, you do edit with your favorite text editor, any text editor, it doesn't matter, it's text, right? And look at that, there's some Python. That Python stored on this thing. Don't have to install anything, don't have to dependency manage, best practices, none of that stuff. You plug this thing in, you look at Python, and you say, when you touch A1, this NeoPixel comes on. Whoop, see, there it goes. And then uh, they say something like, well, how do we turn the lights off? And this is when it's like, well, now you can sort of gauge for what they are into and help them code the turn the light off line. And look at that. I mean, like this will happen quicker than I can explain it to you because I wasn't agreeing with Chris or anything. I was just, you know, talking to my buddy. And uh, we're already like into coding Python and making things happening. And the person's engaged. They want to do things because they like lights. Uh, now, let's see if I can jam through the rest of this. We get this one. Oh, by the way, uh, GitHub link where I throw my secret sauce on this to make it a little more engaging than what you get from Adafruit. So we have another one here with uh, some accelerometer code on it. By the way, the, the device has just all of the Adafruit gizmos loaded up on here. Um, now, this next thing does require installing the Mu editor, um, but it, it's a. Uh, uh oh, I don't know where my mouse is. This, this multi-monitor thing is is got me going here. 
How am I doing on time? I got a timer over here. Woo, minute left. All right. Um, One minute. I heard that, Chris. So good. Mu editor is is on the wrong window. Okay, here we go. Moving the mu editor over here. Um, it is an IDE. Everybody loves IDEs. Uh, even us Vim users like IDEs. So look at this. This is like eight lines of Python, if you include the thing. See this print statement that prints a tuple sort of formatted? This little button here called plotter. It is taking the print output and making something interesting out of it. These are the X, Y, Z. So there it is. Uh, the X, Y, Z of the accelerometer. So when I wave this thing around madly, then, then stuff happens. And once again, this is so easy and people are so into it. Uh, is there anything left to plug? Oh, you're out of time, Cal. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, well, anyway, oh, that was, that was Cal Carsten. That, I'm muting yeah. you, Cal. I'm muting you. That was Cal Carsten with a Brisbane 2011 hat. Was that from the next Confair U? Gosh, that's, uh, I'm surprised you've kept it clean all these years. Okay, uh, up next we have uh, Anthony Aegeus, who's going to talk to us about something that seems pretty important right now. Please make him welcome. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Anthony. Um, I write an email newsletter called The Sizzle. And uh, every day I publish it, and one of the recurring themes is that Facebook are assholes, and um, they keep apologizing for the mistakes that they make, and they never change. So in this talk, I'm going to give five examples of them being gigantic assholes and so we can learn from their mistakes. Uh, the US has quite uh, strong and long-standing anti-discrimination laws. So you can't say in a housing ad, I don't want any blacks. Jews, no Jews for my house, please. You can't say that for good reason. Um, job ads, same thing. No women, you can't say that. However, Facebook allowed advertisers to specifically target ads not at these people. So I could put up a job ad saying, I don't want any women um, in childbearing years. I could say I don't want any people over the age of 55 to see my job ads. Um, I could put up housing ads on Facebook and say, I don't want Jews to see this because I don't want Jews renting my house. 100% illegal, should be very obvious to everybody, but it happened for many, many years until civil, civil liberty groups sued Facebook and then suddenly they were able to apologize and change. And um, despite saying these things, it hasn't changed. You can still do those ads. That was in, and that was in March 2019 that Facebook apologized for doing these bad things. Imagine being a moderator for, for Facebook. Um, you would see a constant stream of awful, awful things. Um, you would think that they would have systems in place to hire the correct people to have the uh, right mental space to handle the, the vile postings of two billion people. Um, you would think that they would have psychological support in case you did see something horrible. Um, and you think they would have policies that would uh, be sane and consistent throughout um, the time you're, you're there, so you don't have to worry about deciding for yourself what's wrong or right. Facebook tells you that. Well, they didn't have any of that, um, so uh, people ended up with PTSD, uh, depression, and substance abuse. Um, and a group of them, a group of American ones, sued Facebook. And as soon as they sued Facebook for their uh, mental health uh, 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 problems, Facebook gave them $52 million, settled at, uh, out of court, and 11,000 moderators uh, went on to claim that they had PTSD, depression, and substance abuse from their job as moderators of uh, uh, Facebook. Um, in, in 2012, the Federal Trade Commission in the US told Facebook, your, your privacy settings are way too confusing. Um, people are, are inadvertently um, exposing their sexual uh, uh, orientation, their political views, their business relationships, and things that they didn't really want to say in public because the things were so confusing, they were saying it out, out, uh, out, uh, out loud. Um, Facebook, uh, F the FTC said Facebook did this on purpose because they wanted to um, get more information from people, and so told Facebook, stop doing that. In 2019, uh, the FTC fined Facebook $5 billion, the most biggest ever fine from a government uh, department, um, for not doing anything. To this day, it's still confusing. If, you know, if, you, if, you, if you've ever, ever, ever tried to log into Facebook and change those settings, it's still a mess. 
Um, election interference. I think we all know about uh, Cambridge Analytica. Um, this, the API for sharing information for, with developers was way too broad. Um, Donald Trump's campaign used the, all, these, all this information that people unknowingly gave. Um, the pro-Brexit campaign um, targeted uh, people with scare campaigns to, to influence their um, uh, election uh, uh, thoughts. <clears throat> and Facebook has apologized for this many, many times, yet we still see disinformation happen on Facebook. That has not changed. Uh, and probably the worst thing that, that Facebook has been part of is a genocide. Um, the United Nations in 2018 um, produced a report saying that Facebook's lack of a moderation team in Myanmar, they had no Burmese-speaking moderators. So in Myanmar, the government uh, posted tons and tons of um, uh, hate campaigns against the Rohingya people. And because no one stopped them, um, the majority got so whipped up and hated the Rohingya based on uh, uh, lies, that there was an ethnic cleansing. A million people fled, um, 25,000 were killed, gang rapes, villages burnt down, uh, horrible, horrible things. Facebook apologized, Facebook admitted to their mistake, yet they are still doing it. So I think these five examples uh, are very big, very broad, but we know now what Facebook has done. I think we can learn from that to think about before you release your code, think about how it might be used um, out in the outside world. Thanks for that, Anthony. Uh, an important message there at the end. Uh, up next, we have Jared Quinn, who's going to be talking to us about home automation and stuff. If I can click on the right buttons to bring up the right feed, because everything is moving around. Okay, go, Jared. Oh, hello, everybody. I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal of the Aurora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. So I'm Jared. Um, this is originally a 44-minute talk. Uh, you can find the full one at the link there. Um, I've been coding for Hurry. way too long now, since I was eight, and I'm in my 40s now. Um, but let's get on with it. Here's some of the cool stuff I work on. Uh, most of it's sports-related, as you'll see. Uh, we do a lot of uh, everything from content to VR to augmented reality to electronics. So uh, I get to uh, play with lots of cool stuff for work. But home automation started with a... Uh, with a problem. We wanted to go skiing and we wanted to turn lights on and off. That used to be an easy problem with uh, timer switches and things, but they're harder to get these days. So we went with a smart switch. Uh, then not long after that, Black Friday happened and I ended up with a bunch more devices. However, having two, lighting, light, having two lights that can only be controlled from a voice speaker is a really annoying kind of experience for any user, even me. Uh, and yeah, guaranteed I'm going to start uh, through this slide and through uh, talking to my smart speaker. So we needed light switches, pretty obvious really. Um, now we're in a rental, so we can't really uh, change fittings and things. So we went with a radio solution being Zigbee. However, we had uh, TP-Link, we had uh, Xiaomi in the Zigbee space, and we had Google Home, we had Alexa. Um, it was getting messy and nothing would talk to each other. So I uh, spent a bit of time, a couple of weeks, searching around for a solution and finally came to Home Assistant. Home Assistant I came to probably in 2017. Uh, its biggest appeal was it was in Python, my go-to language. Um, it's built in async IO, Python async IO, uh, so uh, very async or needs Python 3. And um, yeah, it's really nice to code, uh, code for and you should contribute if you do this too. How does a config look like in Home Assistant? Um, and yeah, there's a lot of slides missing from this, so if it feels a bit disjointed, I did it quickly, and um, I can put the full slide deck up later. But this is what a configuration for the Xiaomi Zigbee buttons looks like in Home Assistant. Very simple. Uh, the secret functionality is a Home Assistant function, and the UI rendered there is the default UI. We can script some automations in YAML, and that just refers to different entities, different conditions, different triggers, and different actions. And uh, yeah, there are the kitchen lights there for uh, long press. So on my buttons, I do a single press is the nearest light, the double press is the next nearest light, and long press turns any light that's currently on of those two onto maximum brightness. So, uh, and that's the same on every button in the house. However, this all ignited a bit more of a passion in electronics, which I hadn't really done much of uh, since I was a teenager. And since I've done this uh, as a hobby, I've started doing more of it for work as well, which has been really cool. I'm going to show you three simple projects you can build for less than $20 each. 
They all use less than 12 volt DC, so you're not going to zap yourself too much with them. No soldering is required, but it's a good idea. Uh, and you don't really need Home Assistant to do it, but it kind of uh, adds to the experience. So the first one I want to talk well, first I'll talk about the microcontroller I like to use for IoT applications, and it's the ESP32 in particular. Um, that's because it's got Bluetooth as well, but most of my smart automation is on Wi-Fi. The first one I built was a fish tank monitor. It was a submersible temperature sensor, uh, and uh, later on took over the role of that first smart plug we got, which was turning the actual 12 volt LED light on and off on the fish tank. This is what my fish tank data looks like. Uh, so it's all served up over Mosquito and MQTT and uh, comes into Home Assistant and this is all default UI from Home Assistant. Then we needed some moon lighting, mood lighting and uh, as you can see here, yep, LED One strip. One minute. Thank you, Chris. Uh, LED strip and uh, some uh, level shifters and a 12 volt power supply to run it. Uh, that's a little one up in the top right corner. And uh, again, on the network, there's a picture of it there and some code in the YAML uh, configuration for Home Assistant to, uh, to generate this UI here. Lastly, we did an entry scanner. So this was basically an integration into Home Assistant's alarm feature. It did uh, RFID tags to scan in and out and would arm the alarm if everybody left. Um, that was kind of a cool one. And that's what it looks like in Home Assistant. Now quickly, before we end, going to meet my house. This is the full UI, or pretty much a full UI of my house in Home Assistant. Entertainment, so first we have switches and general things, the main, the main landing page, entertainment. Uh, weather and snow information, as I mentioned in the early slides, uh, go skiing and um, there we go. Thanks for that, Jared. Contact yourselves, there you we go. Got you got yoked. Okay, uh, that was the second last of our lightning talks. Uh, for our last lightning talk, uh, the general, the world at large has memes. Uh, PyCon Australia has memes. Sometimes there are talks that deal with the intersection of them, and I think that's what Rachel's going to be talking about. Please make her welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. This is our curly boy. This is the Australian Woman's Weekly Children's Birthday Cake Book, Australia's most famous children's cake book. Many, many kids grew up in Australia, including me, would spend so much time looking at this book, trying to work out what they wanted for the next birthday. For my fourth, third birthday, I had an echidna. Uh, for my fourth, I had a jack in the box. And for my fifth, I had the pool cake. Thanks, Mum. And I want to make a cake, but I don't really have anyone to make a cake for other than this good boy, and he really shouldn't eat much cake. But PyCon Line AU is coming up. Okay, so first you need some cake. You can make a cake or just buy some. Lightning Talks from 2019 have a comprehensive list of supermarkets to buy cakes from in Australia and New Zealand for over the last century or so. You want to cut out your cake um, to make your curly boy shapes, assemble your curly boy shapes, make your icing using just over half a kilo of butter. Uh, you might notice that the purple and orange aren't quite as vibrant as they could be. That's because I mixed them from primary colors. They're okay. If you want really bright colors, just get actual colors and don't try and do chemistry at home. Um, Next, put your curly boy together. You're meant to put a like, crumb coating on cake so that the crumbs don't seep through to the nice icing, and it didn't work. Um, but I tried. So putting on the colors, more colors, until our curly boy is taking shape. Um, at this point, it wasn't great, so I just added more icing, smoothed it out over time, had some fridge time, and there we got our curly boy. But it's a, it's a cake. It needs the finest lollies on a cake. You just can't have icing. So my first thought was Meta Curly Boy by adding some killer pythons onto it. Like I'm sure there's some pun in here, but I can't think of it right now. Uh, next, I want to do an Adelaide Curly Boy because that's where we're meant to be this year. I could think of iced coffee and silver balls representing Adelaide. 
Like, yes, I know it isn't Farmers Union, but can you really tell the difference between milk bottles and lolly format? So I messaged my sister who lives in Adelaide. How would you represent Adelaide on a cake? Apparently, there are also pigs in Rondelmoor, and South Australians love AFL and wine. I, I was tempted to get some wine guns, but then I would need to go to the shops again. Um, a lot of defence industry in Adelaide. News Corps was founded, first place to give women the votes, one of the first places where women could get uni degrees. But how to represent on a cake? So I thought about it for a bit, and this is what I came up with. So you can see we've got the coffee milk bottles um, just hanging out. I've got Musk, Musk Stick AFL goalposts. If you haven't had them before, they taste like perfume. Uh, some stacked shiny silver balls and a car race because Adelaide has a big car race each, each year. Um, it was only when I was writing these slides this morning that I realised no one thought of the murders in Adelaide, but once again, how do you represent that on a cake? Um, oh, I have to play this video somehow. Uh, so, I can't zip. Can I play the video? No, I can't play the video. Oh, well. Um, at least I can't work out how. Most contentious part of the cake is the duck with it's the chip It's one minute beak. or I it's tried nothing. Putting chips. Yeah, it's all right. I'll talk about it. I tried to put a chip beak on the, on the curly boy. Yeah, I'm on team don't put chips or popcorn on the cake. I'll post a video up on Twitter. Um, and this is my final curly boy. So starting at the head on the bottom left, uh, we've got the meta killer pythons. We've got some pride flags. Have some marshmallow flowers because I like marshmallow flowers. And on the far right, it's just I didn't know what to do, but I had Jaffa's jelly beans and freckles, so why not? Uh, top right hand corner is my attempt as a flip flop operator. And finally, the Adelaide portion. And you know what? There should be more curly boys. It doesn't have to be all cake. You can paint a curly boy, crochet one, make it out of lasers. And look at what Cynthia Del Rio's kiddo has made, a curly boy made from Lego. Like, I mean, look how great it is. It even's got articulated joints and it's got... So have a clear name in a video chat. Let's come together and make stuff together. Oops, um, I forgot to cut myself off. I forgot to click the wrong... I forgot to add you when I cut you off. Terrible. Anyway, uh, <laughs> thanks, Rachel. Uh, that was a great talk, even with the dig at Farmers Union. Uh, that is all the time we have for lightning talks at this PyCon line. Uh, hopefully when we're back together in the real world or potentially online uh, next year, uh, we'll have even more lightning talks. So you can, uh, so you can uh, think about what you want to present uh, between now and next year and we'll go have a whole bunch more great lightning talks uh for you then uh finally I'd like to thank uh libby berry my fantastic assistant during uh during this uh lightning talks five days ago there were no lightning talks on the schedule for this conference uh magically they have appeared and they've been fantastic and that's happened behind the scenes uh mostly thanks to libby and of course uh the uh no, Wonderful Ryan Burner, who I've just put on screen <laughs> because I always Hello. embarrass Wyatt, Ryan at the end of Lightning Talks. Uh, so, yes, see you next year. Oh, okay. So we're going off live. That means I can talk about my list of top quality anime. No, uh, no, anime? no, Animal stop. names. Cut, mm. cut. Greg, Luna, Turnip, Ham, 